Hi folks, welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. Uh, I'm coming to you from New Zealand on a rather frosty, cold autumn morning. And with me on the show, I have Tim Cohen in Colorado, who's had the opposite, has had rain. And um, we've just been discussing that off here. I interviewed Tim several years ago um, and it was a good interview and we're going to kind of revisit the same topic but just with a few more years knowledge now and um, so welcome Tim and the subject is well you can tell us what the subject is. Thank you Tony pleasure to be with you and the subject is King Charles III as the Antichrist of Biblical Apocalyptic Prophecy the guy who's going to be over global government for three and a half years preceding Armageddon, and uh, yeah, and I mentioned to you, I'm I have him in my kind of basket of possibilities. I'm not a hundred percent convinced, so you'll have to convince me as well. And I've got a couple of questions, and but some interesting observations. Um, you know, like I watched the coronation, uh, and I have to say that leading up to it. The music, it was, some of that music was so chaotic and I was at a friend's place yeah. and I said, my goodness, it sounds like they're expecting the entrance of Dracula or something, not not a king. And I said, well, that's perfect music if you want to create chaos and have the Antichrist come in. Um, of course, once he were actually in there, the music was much more settled, but some of that pipe organ music early on was just unbelievably chaotic. And um, so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, I did notice... During the um, when they were putting the anointing oil, blessing the anointing oil, there was a phoenix, a golden phoenix that they were holding, and I thought that has nothing to do with Christianity. The phoenix is a false symbol; it's obviously the all of that. So that's a you may probably address it, but but I was also <sighs> thinking Charles looked like a doddery old man, and. Basically, some of the vows and some of the things were, you know, swearing allegiance to Jesus Christ, basically. And I was thinking, how could somebody then turn around from that to being the Antichrist um, and uh, above all other gods and so forth? Um, it just like I, I had my, I had my difficulties getting my head around that possibility. He just didn't seem like a potential person that you could put in that position. But anyway. So that's my intro. <laughs> All right. So first, I'll congratulate you on noticing that was a phoenix because I've pointed that out already in interviews oh, okay. this past week, and you are the only other person I've ever heard mention that. Ah, no, yeah, I were saw it straight on off. It on, they were saying on television news, you know, when they were covering it, that it was an eagle, which yeah. obviously it's not. Brilliant. Very good. Now, uh, in fact, Charles did not swear allegiance to Christ. He kissed the Bible, but he, at the coronation, said that he wanted to protect and defend, basically, all faiths and religions, and all the people representing different faiths and religions throughout, not just the UK, but the world. So there are a number of things we'll get to there, but before we go into all that, I think it's important to focus on what Scripture says in terms of our identifying the Antichrist. All right. What are the biblical requirements to actually identify this person when the time comes in history? So am I able to share my screen with you? Yes, you can, yeah. Okay, let me let me try to do that here. Being, All right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, so the scripture says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, regarding this individual who's going to be over global government for three and a half years, it says, Here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast— for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So there are three points I make from this. One is that before you can calculate the number, there's this imagery of a beast that's involved. The second is that there's a man represented by that beast. And the third is that the system for doing the calculation itself you know, which works out to 666, is actually given to us in the underlying Greek text. And this is something most Christians who've ever wrestled with this topic have not known. They haven't looked at the original Greek. So the number 666 is not given in the form of words. It's given in the form of three letters, one for 600, a second for 60, a third for six. And it's the ancient biblical numbering system. So it actually identifies for us the system on which the calculation is to be done. Now, that system in Greek was derived from the original Hebrew 
numbering system that's called Kabbalic or Kabbalism today, but it's just the ancient biblical numbering system that was subsumed into Jewish mysticism and Kabbalism. At any rate, the title, and we're going to look at this for a moment. Well, actually, let me show you the imagery of the beast first. Let's do that. So at the beginning of this chapter, the Apostle John is speaking, and he says that this beast is like a leopard, feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion, if my screen will stop that highlighting. <laughs> mouth like the mouth of a lion, right here. And then it tells us that the dragon gives him his power throne and great authority. In the prior chapter, that dragon is identified as a fiery red dragon. So if I look for this, oh, sorry. I don't know if you hear that beep or not, but here it is, fiery red dragon. And it goes on to tell us that that dragon is Satan and is the serpent who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so there's a fiery red dragon identified as Satan, gives this beast that has a body which resembles a leopard, resembles the feet of a bear, resembles the mouth of a lion. So these are similes, like, like, like. It's not precisely those things, but they're similes. So that imagery is the first required thing, and it has to pertain to a human being, a man, before we can bother to do the name calculation. Are you following that, Tony? Yeah. Okay. There's only one human being in the history of the world to have that imagery, and that is King Charles III. It's his heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales. And even though his title, Prince of Wales, has been absorbed, if you will, into the crown, and he's no longer using it, this heraldic achievement, which he, which he was given when he was crowned Prince of Wales in July 1969, is still his and will forever be his and unique to him. On it is the red dragon of Revelation 12 and 13 right here. I'm circling it. Yeah. Adopted in 1953 as a national symbol of Wales. So when he was crowned, coronated Prince of Wales and prior to that created Prince of Wales, he became Prince of the Red Dragon, Prince of Satan. It's his crowning that was particularly significant. And let me just point out, William has been created Prince of Wales at this point, now that the title is dormant with Charles. But William has not been invested or crowned Prince of Wales. And for Charles, that was 11 years apart from when he was created Prince of Wales before he was crowned as such. It may or may not ever happen, in other words, with William. Mm -hmm. But William lacks the symmetry. So you have here a beast with feet like a bear, and they are actually bear's claws in the graven version of this, shown at the castle at Caranarvon Castle, where Charles is crowned in July 1969. I show those in the book. So it's actually got bear's claws uh, on the graven version, but here they're exaggerated claws, like feet of a bear. There are actually five claws per foot. The fifth one is hidden on this. But body with proportions like those of a leopard, mouth that reminds us of a lion's mouth, feet like feet of a bear. The red dragon is on this. And for Charles, coronated crown Prince of Wales or Prince of the Red Dragon, the dragon literally did give him his power throne and great authority. And it's as Prince of Wales, in fact, that he built up his power base beneath him over a period of decades. And I'll just tell you, he's been running the world since 1969, since he was crowned Prince of the Red Dragon, Prince of Satan. A lot of people don't know that. Even without the global government, Charles has been running the world the entire time effectively. And I'll go into examples when we talk about that. On here also, I want to point out one other thing, is a unicorn that has the eyes of a man. And that is true even on the most prominent unofficial version, also shown in this book. But it's got a visible sclera. It's not the solid round eye that you would see on a horse normally, for example. So it's a little horn of the eyes of a man, a, un a unicorn of the human eyes. Now, so he's got the imagery of Revelation 13 here, which is what we need to do the calculation. I'll point out one other thing before we go into the calculation itself. And that is in Daniel chapter 7, the exact same individual who is to rule for uh, three and a half years is called a little horn with the eyes of a man. And so if we get to eyes here, oh, sorry, well, there it is. A horn were, were eyes like the eyes of a man. So, okay, so a little horn that has eyes like the eyes of a man. In this chapter, Daniel chapter 7, just as you also see in Revelation chapter 12, 
it says that this individual is going to have control rule for a time, times, and half a time, or two years, one year, and half a year, three and a half years. In Revelation chapter 11, if we go back to it, that's identified as a period of 42 months and also as 1,260 days. So we know that we're actually talking about three and a half years when we say times, times, and a half a time. All right, with that preamble, let's look at the name calculation. Yeah, and let me point out also, Charles is the only person in the history of the world to also have the name calculation on the biblical system. So here it is. This is the original Hebrew system. The numbers are assigned sequentially, not phonetically. They drop off after 400 because there are only 22 glyphs in the Hebrew language. English has 26. In Greek, they expanded the system, and this is a page from the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, my book, which gives the hard evidence that Charles is the Antichrist. So the first edition was published in 1998, but here's the page from that edition, and you can see here's the Greek on the right, the Hebrew language, Cuts off after 22 characters. English continues through Z or Z. And in Greek, they expanded the system to include 500 through 900, not part of the original Hebrew system. Okay. The title, Charles, Prince of Wales, in both languages, and he, in Hebrew, it's Nasik, Charles, of Wales. Mem for of, Nasik for a prince who's an heir apparent to a throne. Charles and Wales both transliterated the way you'd see them in the modern Israeli press. So this is how it's actually spelled, no tampering, in the modern Israeli press, Nasik Charles of Wales. And then, of course, Prince Charles of Wales or Charles Prince of Wales. Both languages, the title works out to exactly 666, completely different combination of numbers. Same system, the original biblical system. So, Tony, that alone is mathematically impossible. Even if the universe were 15 billion years old, this, what you're looking at, could still never, ever happen. That's how much the uh, odds are against this alone. That's without even taking into account the presence of the imagery for okay. Charles. Well, so can I notice you're using the, King, the, the new King James Version. Can I just go to one scripture and get your take on it? Um, I've sure. been thinking about it because I know this is one that people have brought out to say, oh, no, it can't be Charles because of this. And this is the New King James Version, and it's Daniel 11.21, and it says uh, in the New King James Version, and then I'm going to give you the King James Version. And, and well, in let, this me, place, let me just pause you there, Tony. Yeah. It's not necessary because Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 11, both chapters, are dealing with a king of the north of the Seleucid dynasty versus a king of the south of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Up through verse 39, actually, Daniel 11, all the way through verse 39, is already fulfilled historically. So the verse you're reading was fulfilled historically by Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a type of the Antichrist. So there are two little horns in Daniel. There's the one I mentioned in Daniel 7. There's another one in Daniel 8, which is in parallel to the verse you were about to read from 1121. So in other words, Charles is a type of the individual, the verse you're about to read, and I'll let you read it, but I want to point out that verse is not about the Antichrist. It's about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a type of the Antichrist to come historically and who desecrated the temple in the second century BC. A lot of Christians conflate Daniel 8 and 11 with the Antichrist, for example, in Revelation 13, also with the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7. They're actually different individuals historically. Verses 35 to 39 of Daniel chapter 11 have a dual fulfillment. They'll be fulfilled again in the Great Tribulation by a different person from Charles, a different person from the Antichrist, somebody who is in the region of Iraq and Assyria, historically that region of the world. And then verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11 have never been fulfilled before in history. Those will be fulfilled by that same individual who will refulfill verses 35 to 39. So with that preamble, we'll go ahead and ask your question and I'll relate it after that to Charles. Okay, As well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you've put that. Um, that's an interesting, you know, perspective. Um, I was going to say that the New King James Version. You, you could say, well, it's, you know, where it says he's not given the honor of royalty. But if you actually look at the King James Version, it says, um, it says, 
And in his estate shall arise a vile person to whom they shall not give the honour of the kingdom, and he, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. I was thinking that's the honour of the kingdom anyway. That could be to do with the um, not necessarily the royal, the kingdom of Great Britain anyway. It could be the Middle East. So that's kind of... Well, it can it, also be the global government, the way that that's going to come to pass. I mean, look at... I'll give an example of how Charles is running the world. I mentioned I would do that, and we can talk about the Great Reset here briefly. Yep. So the Great Reset has almost all the leaders of the world yes. signed on to it yes. under Klaus Schwab, who yep. founded the World Economic Forum yep. in, in uh, 1970 or 1971, whichever year it was. Not okay. long after, Charles was invested as Prince of Wales in July 1969. So Justin Trudeau, for example, of Canada, more than half his cabinet is part yep. of the World Economic Forum. A big part of the Biden regime is. Yes. Uh, you can Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, both part yeah. of the World Economic Forum. Our former you can prime go right minister. down the line. Our former yeah. prime minister almost in New all Zealand the, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Almost all the world leadership and and Charles is the one who announced the Great Reset yeah. from the World Economic Forum, not Klaus Schwab. Yes. And he did that months before Klaus Schwab came out with his book by that title. Mm -hmm. Klaus Schwab is a knight of Charles. And Agenda 2030 is Charles' agenda, which Klaus Schwab is carrying out under Charles. And I can go through many examples like that, and I and that's all documented, of course, in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, showing that Charles is at the top of the hierarchy. In terms of how he might come to power over a global government, you know, without any kind of election whatsoever. You know, I pointed this out even in the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, but Daniel chapter seven, that same chapter, that talks about a little horn of the eyes of a man who's going to rule for three and a half years. It says he comes in among 10 horns and he uproots three of them. So he effectively becomes the eighth among seven and also the 11th among 10, if you will. So the word horn is conical. It's tusk shaped like an elephant's tusk, or it's like a chemistry flask or vial. Like you see this thing that I'm circling on the screen here. There's this label of the eldest son around the necks of the beasts on Charles' heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales. This label makes these beasts specific to Charles himself. This is the label of the eldest son. But the overall heraldic achievement or coat of arms has its own head right here at the center top with a sovereign helm. And across that helm are seven bars that are shaped like elephant's tusks. Right beneath it is the label of the eldest son again that looks like three horns plucked up by the roots. Ten horns in a head, three plucked up by the roots. The little horn of the eyes of man comes, on, uh, comes up among them. That symbolism is also on Charles' heraldic achievement as uh, Prince of Wales. So that being pointed out, uh, there are five permanent UN members to the Security Council who have veto rights. They've talked about reforming the UN and multiple proposals have made, been made over the years. But every two or three years, they come back to this notion of expanding it to 10 permanent members. And they've identified two of the new five, which will be Japan and Germany. You know, if and when the expansion transpires, when that happens, three of the 10 will be from the European Union. Those are Japan, Germany, excuse me, Germany, France, and England, I mean to say. Five from the East, five from the West, as we think of the East-West division in the world. If Germany, France, and England were then to declare Charles, for example, as their monarch, or declare the British monarchy as effectively the monarchy of the European Union, or anything along those lines, or simply to unify their diplomatic missions again, as they were unified prior to Brexit, in that circumstance, Charles would automatically be over three of the 10. That's the precise scenario given in Daniel for the formation of the global government. That could happen in two days. One day we could wake up, the UN Security Council has been expanded. Another day they could say they've reunified the dipl diplomatic missions or the EU has decided to acknowledge the genealogical heritage of the British monarchy and the fact that it really is the monarchy of Germany, France, and England and other European nations, for example. So he could come in peaceably and gain control over global government, a brand new one, with no election whatsoever. And so he has the imagery he has the name calculation, two things no other human being has ever had, which his sons do not have. And by the way, William and Harry and no other human being on the planet today, even now, has an actual name or title without any kind of tampering that works out to 666 
on this biblical numbering system. And in the case of Charles, it's in two different languages on the original system, hmm. Hebrew and English, no tampering at all. And um, so those things, Tony, prove that he is the Antichrist. And when we come around to the coronation, because I know we've got limited time today, let's talk about what really happened at Charles crowning and why it's not actually Christian at all, what transpired. So for, and I'm gonna go to some imagery, I'll give some, um, some, Examples and by the way, here's your Phoenix Flash flask. I mean to say, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, standing actually atop what looks like a fiery thing. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely a phoenix. There's no doubt about it. Uh huh. And yeah. this is what the oil from Jerusalem was put in. This is what was used to actually anoint Charles with the oil behind that screen at his coronation. They poured it from this phoenix on his head, on his shoulders, and on his arms. So let's go now to some of the imagery. I'll walk through it a little bit uh, as best I can uh, in order. You know, one of the things that everybody was talking about publicly um, pretty quickly was that there was this thing that seemed to be a Grim Reaper. I'll play this short clip. You'll see what looks like a Grim Reaper pa pa passing the entrance to Westminster Abbey before Charles comes in. So that's a still of it right there. And then I'll play the footage so you can see it in motion. All right, yeah. Hmm. So people saw that online, and the Sky News captured it too, not just the BBC. But they saw this online, and they thought, man, that looks like the Grim Reaper. Now, other people have come and said, well, it could be a Druid. More people have said it could be a verger, yeah, like from the Greek Orthodox Church yeah. with the hood. Some of them wear a hood. The, uh, I don't know if it's the ranking verger or not, but the one who seems to be in the center of their group photo, the one I found, uh, has a, a staff that looks very similar to the one that was carried by this individual who passed this entrance. So whether it was a verger or a druid, you know, doesn't really matter. What matters is this was allowed to happen. It wasn't happenstance or accidental, it was planned. Mm. And it reminded the world of the angel of death or the grim reaper. And that's what people were talking about publicly all over the world mm. when they saw this, right before Charles entered the event. So with that being shown, Charles was led by a cross that uh, is really about um, ecumenism. It has slivers in it of what are claimed to be pieces of the cross of Christ, the crucifixion right, cross, yeah. given by the Roman pontiff Francis to Charles, who then gave it to the Welsh Anglican Communion or Anglican Church there in Wales uh, to put into a cross that Charles commissioned a couple of years ago before he was king, made out of sustainable items, you know, so Welsh slate, like at his investiture, silver and so forth, in the center of that cross beneath a semi-transparent uh, pink or rose-colored jewel. Now, that preceded Charles into Westminster Abbey, carried, I believe, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, if I'm not mistaken, but that preceded Charles into, the West, into Westminster Abbey for the crowning. When Charles first went in, he greeted non-Christians, non-Christian, quote unquote, faith leaders. So there was a Sikh, a Hindu, a Buddhist, uh, a couple of Muslims, both a Sunni, a Sunni Muslim and a Shia Muslim, Shiite, and a Zoroastrian, an unbelieving Jewish, the chief rabbi of the UK, who's also a Knight of Charles, uh, and some others. All people he greeted, you know, and who participated in the event. That's never happened before in history. So 1,100 plus years of history destroyed in one day by Charles, where in the past it was always a strictly Christian, quote unquote, coronation, where no person who, you know, publicly admitted to being a non-Christian was allowed to even participate in any way, shape, or form. They could be there maybe as a guest, but that was it. But here Charles got them, has them actually participating. So as the things proceed, um, Charles... Uh, is going to be 
anointed with oil from this flask that we saw, right? Yeah. Right here. He's going to be anointed with oil. The oil was produced in Jerusalem from olives grown on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to be crowned king of Israel. And that's what happened. A lot of people don't know this, Tony. The British monarchy officially claims to sit upon the throne of King David. Elizabeth II was officially crowned queen of thy people Israel, quote unquote. Charles was crowned king of Israel behind that screen. And people don't know that. Everybody could hear what happened with Elizabeth. They didn't air all of it, but the audience in attendance could hear it. Behind this screen, they were playing music. And let me show the screen here. Um, I've got a few images of it that I saved. So I'll open one up here. So this is the screen. It's a fake tree of life. All these leaves for the Commonwealth nations have the names of the nations in them. At the base is Charles Cipher as king. And then there's this snake-like banner that says, uh, all is well, all shall be well, you know, in essence. And at the top, a couple of heralding angels, and then of course a dove with this sun-like disc, you know, behind their heads. Behind this screen, the oil was put on Charles while he was dressed only in a white, you know, like almost like a something you'd wear before you go to bed to sleep, right? Yeah. Very simple garment, white. The women who participated, the royal women, all dressed in white, wearing white gowns that resembled Druidic robes, but they were actually dresses in this case. That's never happened before in history either. In the past, they always had these very fancy dresses that were in accord with the decor of the day or whatever was popular of the day. Here, they, they did druidic imagery. Now, something I'll point out here in terms of the chair on which Charles was crowned. This is uh, St. Edward's chair. And yeah, I'll pull up a smaller image of it so we can see the whole chair right here that I'm circling. Yeah. There's a stone at the base of this chair called the Stone of Destiny or the Stone of Schoon, S-C-O-N-E, that is alleged to be the stone on which Jacob rested his head when he had the vision of the angels going up and down the ladder, you know, thousands of years ago, the vision from the Lord, and the same night that he wrestled with the Lord, you know, the angel of the Lord. They allege that this is that stone. We actually know, though, that it's quarried from somewhere in Scotland, so it's a fraud. But the British monarchy for several centuries has still used it nonetheless. What it really is, Tony, is a Logan stone. It's a druidic Logan stones, Logan stone. And the Logan stone is also known as a throne stone. And it's also a stone on which they sacrificed human beings historically. They are Satanists, these druids. Yeah. And in this case, we're talking about Gorsed druidry. Charles' grandparents and his mother and father, all of them, were part of Gorsed Druidry. Queen Elizabeth II, when she was princess, was initiated in a forest in Wales into Gorsed Druidry with a Logan stone present. Gorsed Druidry has the red dragon as its central core symbol. It's the main symbol of Gorsed Druidry, just like it has, Wales has it on their national flag now. It's a satanic order of Druidry. They're Satanists. So mm -hmm. Charles was actually made a Druidic king at this event. He was, by the way, also at his investor in July 1969, something else addressed in the Antichrist and Cup of Tea, but that's something that happened behind the screen, you know, where nobody could see what was occurring. So when he came out from behind that screen, he sat on the throne and he was given a number of items. The people who handed these items to him normally in, in a traditional ceremony would have all been Anglican Protestants. Oh, and by the way, there was a Roman Catholic priest who participated also. I forgot to mention that. Kind of important. And something else I should mention. You see these garments that they're all wearing? Yeah. These bishops and archbishops? Yeah. Now, and here's Charles in his simple garment on which he was anointed with that, with oil from that flask yeah. from this phoenix. Those garments were all donated by the Roman Catholic Church. They were borrowed from Roman Catholics. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're not the normal garments. The Archbishop of Canterbury here, Justin Welby, didn't yeah. want to spend the money to have new garments made, so he borrowed garments, wow. requested them from the Pope, huh. from Francis, and they were granted. And so here Charles is kneeling after he's been anointed, and all of this has been done. After they pray here over him, 
He's going to go back and sit on Edward's throne. You know, this throne right here that I'm circling. You know, and this is um, kind of a CGI recreation of the thing right here. Yeah. But he's going to sit on it, you know, above this Logan stone here. And, you know, above this real one right here, the, this fraudulent real one. And while that's happening, they're going to hand him various items. Well, the people who handed these things to him, rather than being Christians, were, for the most part, these pagan faith leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he received golden spurs, you know, an item yeah. of knighthood. He received, in this case, a woman gave him the sword briefly, the sword of state. Yeah. Uh, normally, women weren't allowed to participate either historically. It was always male priests, you know, or bishops. Uh, so he was given a white glove. The spurs, uh, the bracelets, a ring, you know, like he's married at this point. It's a marriage ceremony too. A ring. Then later he was given, you know, the the scepter and the rod. And they have different names and meanings. I go into that in the book. But the point I want to get to here is they were all handed to him for the most part by non-Christians, yes. or in one case, a woman. That's anathema. Then after all that's been done. And he's been crowned. And let me show a photo of him. Uh, this is later in the ceremony, so I'm not going to detail this at the moment. I just want people to see what's on his head here. So this is the normal uh, crown for the monarch, in this case, fitted for Charles. A different crown was put upon him when he was on that throne, after he was anointed. And that was St. Edward's crown, only temporarily put upon him to crown him king. And then they swapped it for this one. But you'll see that he's holding the scepter, yep. right? Uh, this lady has been given back the sword. Yeah. And then he's holding the orb, which has the cross atop it. And the orb is again represented atop the crown also here. Yeah. Showing that he's king over the world, effectively. And you know, the United Kingdom had an empire that was very large. Mm. In fact, it was the largest empire in human history, bigger than the Roman Empire historically. And today it's got the Commonwealth. Do you know that when somebody's made a knight of the British Commonwealth, they're actually KBE, knight of the British Empire still? Yeah. As if the empire hasn't gone away. Yes, yeah. And today, about a third of the world's population is in the Commonwealth. Well, so which Charles, we are, of course, in New Zealand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to point out here, though, is... Oh, and by the way, there were multiple 666s six, six, in this whole deal, too. So this coronation, May 6, 2023, if you add up the digits, you get 18 for the date, mm -hmm. three times six. But it was also six months, six weeks, and six days after Queen Elizabeth II's funeral. Then Charles on one finger was wearing, and he still is wearing it, you can barely see it right here, but his gold ring, which has the badge of the Black Prince on it, which has three ostrich feathers in the form of uh, a Druidic Awen, which is, a, which is a symbol that's a counterfeit of the Hebrew shin. I go into that in my book, but I mention it because those three ostrich feathers and that badge, it's called the Badge of the Black Prince or the Prince of Darkness or the Black One. Charles has worn that since before he married Diana. The whole time, he never takes it off. He's always seen in public with it on, but that's basically identifying him as the Prince of Darkness. And the three ostrich feathers are in the shape of Vavs. That's the Hebrew letter Vav. And that letter... If I go back to uh, here, the Hebrew letter Vav, which is this one right here that I'm circling. Yeah. Enlarge it. The three ostrich feathers are in this pattern, that shape. So it's oh, like 666 six, yeah. six on that ring. And then one other place, the robe for Camilla, her cipher, which is Camilla um, Regina, which stands for Queen Camilla. But her cipher has three sixes in the base of it, carefully woven, hidden into the base of it. And atop her royal robe, both the purple one and the crimson one in which she entered and the one she left, yeah, reverse order, the one she left with and the one she entered with, her cipher's atop it, trailing behind her with the three sixes at the end of her robe, right? She's married to Charles. So just to point that out, the three sixes were there. At any rate, getting back to Charles now, when he's on the throne here, and being crowned, and I don't have an image right here to show you of that yet. But anyway, boy, when he's uh, on this thing, I do have one image that I'll bring up here. 
So this is uh, right as he's about to, uh, I don't know if he's sitting down. I think he's, no, he's not sitting he's down standing, yet. Yeah. yeah, they're going to put a gold vest on him, a gold robe, and then a bunch of other things over the top of him. And, and then they're going to give him those vestments, right? He's going to sit on that throne. And they're going to do the 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 crowning, you know, a St. Edward's crown, and then they're going to swap it out for the state crown uh, for him as king. But with all of that, some things are going to be said. One of those is that he's going to defend, you know, and protect all religions and all faiths. So he's not, in other words, agreeing to be defender of the faith. You know, he's doing what he said he wanted to do in the 1990s, which is to be defender of faith, quote unquote, meaning anything and everything, not not just Anglican Protestantism or biblical Christianity. Okay, so he's doing the thing that he said he would not do right after he became king, after his mother died. You know, when he first spoke publicly, he indicated he was going to be known as defender of the faith. Well, he violated that at his coronation. He lied. And then the next thing that happened here is the whole world was asked to pledge allegiance to Charles. Mm. That's never happened before in history. In the past, only somebody like the Prince of Wales, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, participating in knights, uh, you know, actual participants who were knights, would have pledged fealty to the monarch. And that's what we see also in Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. But for Charles, he actually had the whole world pledge allegiance to him. And something very significant about that is supposedly it's Justin Welby himself, right here, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who put that into the event. I don't know if that's true or not. That's what's been reported. But why that's so significant is that the second beast of Revelation 13, the first beast is the Antichrist. That's Charles, that imagery we looked at earlier. The second beast, his role is to call the world to follow after the first beast and to worship the first beast after he receives a mortal wound and recovers from it in a way that the world begins to worship him. So we're not there yet at that point in history. But what Welby did or whomever did by putting that call to the world to pledge allegiance to Charles into this coronation, what was done there is exactly the kind of thing that the false prophet is going to do. That second beast of Revelation 13 is the false prophet. And he said to have two horns like a lamb. Now the mitre that the Roman Catholic Pope wears, yeah, and Roman pontiffs wear, if you look at it from the side, it looks like it's got two horns, right? Yeah. It's, form, it's formed after the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, a particular hat that they wore. Well, the Anglican Protestant Church, their bishops wear the same kind of hat. And the one Welby wore here was given to him by the Roman Catholics, mm. you know, along with the robes for the ceremony, the gold one that he wore. And it looked like he had two horns atop his head from the side, right? If you want to be very metaphorical about it. So we have, in other words, the imagery of the crowning of the Antichrist and the imagery of the false prophet. And I'm not saying Welby is that. I still think it's the final pope of the Roman Catholic Church yeah. most likely, but the imagery of the false prophet participating in this, calling the world to follow after the beast, the first beast, which is Charles himself. So with all of this, you have the imagery of death that has entered in. You have the imagery of the first beast of Revelation 13 and the little horn of the human eyes, a man's eyes of Daniel 7. You have the name calculation identified in scripture exactly as scripture says to do the calculation with no tampering with the name. You have somebody upending 1100 years of tradition and history and destroying what's supposed to be a strictly Christian coronation by overtly and intentionally involving pagans in it and pledging not to defend the faith, but everything other than the faith, essentially. Totally betraying any Christian aspect to this event. And here you have seated not just the bishops, the ostensible Christians, right, that I'm circling yeah. here, but also the pagans yeah. here and other participants, like the royal women over here in the Druidic-like dresses, if you will. So you have all of this opulence, a couple thousand participants. Now I'm going to show something else that's really a very big deal that happened at this event. So the coronation, Charles invited a couple thousand guests. His mother had about 8,000. At the bottom center of Charles' coronation invitation was the head of the green man, right here. 
is strictly pagan and satanic symbol. And it relates to the god of the wood in witchcraft, Wicca, versus the goddess of the wood, whose name is Diana. So Diana was sacrificed at De Alma Tunnel in a place historically in France that was an actual location of ritual sacrifice historically in France where she died. And her name is the namesake of the patron goddess of witchcraft. Charles has studied these things when he studied the anthropology at Cambridge. He's the most educated Prince of Wales in history. But then he chose for himself this green man symbol to be at the bottom of his coronation invitation. And you'll notice it's got a crown of thorns on its head right here. Do you see this? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a symbol that is a chimera between a lion and a human head. Yeah. That's meant to represent death because there's foliage growing out of the mouth and out of its uh, orifices. And then there's a crown of thorns on top of it, signifying Charles himself as the green man. Now, several years ago, while I was working on the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, I had concluded that Charles himself is the green man in Wicca and in paganism, that that's what he is to them. Now, all of a sudden, here he is actually sticking that himself on his invitation to identify himself as precisely that, but also to identify him as Christ-like figure with the crown of thorns on his head. So eco-fascism played a role in this event, along with explicit paganism. Another thing that Charles destroyed, his mother's coronation invitation, and got it somewhere, maybe not. Um, well, yeah, I think I can find it to show to you. Here's hers from 1953. Instead of the green man, she's got symbols of the vestments of the coronation. So the crown, the sword. You can see the phoenix here, right? Yeah. The orb. Charles replaced all that right here with the green man to give you an idea of how important it was to him. And his full invitation to his coronation is right here. And on it is Camilla's heraldic achievement at the top with a boar. On this is Charles' new royal achievement. He's got three new ones. They add to his achievement as Prince of Wales. They don't replace it. So now he's got additional ones. This is the state version of his royal achievement as king. And it's got a unicorn with human eyes, the beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, a lion, although this artist made it look more like a lion's feet on this one. So not in accord with his uh, Prince of Wales heraldic achievement, which is actually the significant one. But on the boar, they did something weird and made it look like it's got one tusk to try to make it look like it's a unicorn for Camilla, mm -hmm. almost. Same thing here again with this boar's head. That's unusual. I haven't ever seen that done in heraldry before. Usually they show the two tusks on any boar yeah. that they're representing in heraldry. At any rate, so they've got his and her heraldic achievements and the green man down here at the center, bottom. And other things like a bee and a... And, uh, uh, a bee right here and a butterfly somewhere in here and um, the rose for the Rosicrucians actually and the boar down here again. So anyway, that's his invitation, made it totally pagan and did some things related to his Terra Carta initiative. Yeah, it was Earth Initiative, so eco-fascism. That's why, why I'm going to talk about that in the book, but that's why it's got all that foliage here in the invitation as well. It's very much Wiccan and Druidic and Pagan, the whole thing. So that's another unique thing to the aspect. And this tree, of course, is a fake tree of life, the screen that he used. You know, normally they'd have a hoopah, a Jewish hoopah, a canopy over Charles, and it would be open and everybody would be able to hear what was being said. You know, and they'd be able to see the oil being poured on his head. All that would be open and public for the, for the world to see. All of it was hidden here. So for all we know, Tony, Charles could have been swearing allegiance to the devil behind this screen. And I'm not just saying that tongue in cheek. He literally could have been doing that. Whatever he did, the public statements he made make it clear that he's not a Christian. Christians know that the only way to salvation is through Messiah Yeshua or Christ Jesus, the God of Israel, 
that the God of the universe who created the universe is incarnate in Christ, in Messiah, and that salvation is through him alone. That is something that Charles, his mother before him, his father, his grandparents before them, none of them ever believed that. In fact, I don't know of a single, ma a single royal in the British royal family who actually believes that the only way to salvation is to believe in Yeshua and Jesus. Instead, what they believe is there are multiple ways to God. So from their perspective, if you're a faithful Muslim, you'll be saved. If you're a faithful Hindu, you'll be saved. Faithful to the tenets, in other words, of that religion or quote unquote faith system. You know, a faithful Sikh, a faithful uh, Shia or Sunni Muslim, a, a, a faithful Zoroastrian, a faithful pagan, a faithful witch, whatever, faithful Satanist, okay? So all this is to say Charles had a distinctly pagan coronation, and the, the most shocking thing of the whole thing to me is not that he made it satanic and pagan, but that he asked the world to pledge allegiance to him. Hmm. And that's a form of witchcraft. That's a form of trying to speak into reality, to manifest in reality, something that, that Charles and the devil want to see occur. You know, God spoke the universe into existence. And so certain pagans, particularly witches, for example, and certain pagans, have this practice of speaking things, thinking that their words take on a life of their own, that they manifest reality in some sense in an occult uh, mystical way. And what they were doing in calling the world to pledge allegiance to Charles was that sort of thing on a global level, a global scale. And of course, the world is going to follow after the Antichrist, as scripture says. So with all that being said, I'll point a couple other things out. This rabbi spent the night at Charles Palace, St. James Palace. Uh, I think it was St. James, but wherever it was, he spent the night where Charles did before this event, and there was a blood moon before this event on the night of the 5th. So they chose this date very carefully for all of these things to happen, and also at springtime, springtime of the year. And uh, there will now be in Israel people looking seriously at Charles as the Messiah. They've been talking in Israel since the 1970s about the possibility of Charles being the Messiah. Because, you know, allegedly, his family sits on the throne of David. And they have an official lineage, which, by the way, Tony, let me show it, is available with the book from Prophecy House. So people can order the second edition now, right here, on at prophecyhouse.com. But if they go down here, they can get the official lineage chart of Queen Elizabeth II, um, pardon me, with the book. And on that chart, right here, it explicitly shows the British monarchy's claim to sit upon the throne of David. And it explicitly shows Elizabeth II's claim to be queen of Israel on that chart. So because of things like that, there's been talk in Israel in the rabbinic community for decades about the possibility that the Messiah might come from the British royal family now for the first time in the modern nation state of his, uh, modern nation state of Israel, there's a male monarch and on a throne who explicitly claims to be the monarch of Israel and to sit on David's throne. Even though you and I, as Christians, would know that it is Yeshua, Jesus, who's actually yeah. sitting on David's throne in reality. But nonetheless, this is the claim that's made. And so Israel also has five possible red heifers in the land right now. There have only been like 19, I think, in the history of the world. Yeah, in the whole history of Israel. Thousands of years. And now suddenly, of those, there's five in the land. Possibly. And when each one in succession gets to be two years in a day and age, they'll re-examine that uh, cow and see if it's still completely red. And if it is, they'll turn the thing to ash. And at that point, they'll have everything they need to proceed with constructing a holy place on the Temple Mount and restarting the sacrifice and offering. And they'll begin some of that even sooner. So now we're moving to the point where they're going to want to construct a holy place on the Temple Mount. Now there's one more thing I'll show here. You know, I showed the imagery, right? 
um, yeah. and the name calculation. The first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea was published in 1998. I began writing the book in 1987 when I was still a cadet at the Air Force Academy after God showed me who the Antichrist was. I asked him to show me who and what was being spoken of in Revelation 13, that very bizarre imagery, you know, beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, and so forth. And then he led me within a month to the English name calculation and this heraldic achievement. I had those things in my possession while still at the academy. Well, in the early 2000s, years after the first edition of the Antichrist kept he was published, Charles was officially hailed as savior of the world, quote unquote. This statue was commissioned by a Brazilian state government, the government of Tocantins, on the outskirts of a rainforest in central Brazil, where Tocantins is. And then it was presented to Charles. This is the miniature version reported on and photographed by the BBC at the time. And at the base of this statue is written the phrase, Savior of the World. The statue has Charles' face. It's an angelic winged figure that they call a winged god. They're calling Charles a winged god, dressed only in a loincloth, and they're calling him Savior of the World. And he's standing atop a mass of humans looking up to him supposedly as savior, right? One drinking yeah. a bottle of wine. This is a complete perversion and inversion of Genesis 3.15, where the Messiah comes trampling on the heads of God's enemies. Here, Charles is trampling on the heads of humanity, mm. ostensibly looking up to him as savior, rather than Christ as savior. And it's got his face. But dressed only in a loincloth, this is actually a portrayal, uh, Tony, of Charles as Zeus and Jupiter, mm. as the head god of the pantheon of gods of pagans. Zeus and Jupiter were historically portrayed in this manner, either dressed only in a loincloth or completely naked, sometimes with outspread wings. And if they didn't have the outspread wings on the statue itself as an angelic figure, they'd have a, a bird of prey like an eagle right next to the statue with the outspread wings. This is the idol, the full-size version of it, which is 10 cubits in height, ostensibly, that's going to be placed on the Temple Mount, the full-size version of this, after they start to construct a new holy place. It's ready to go. It's already, it already exists. It's in a crate somewhere, ready to put atop the Temple Mount. So Charles has the actual idol that's to be the desolating abomination spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel 9, 27 and which Christ himself spoke about in the Olivet Discourses in the New Testament, and which was typified by Antiochus IV Epiphanes and spoken about in Daniel chapter 11, that was put in the temple historically to desecrate the temple in the second century BC. That's the whole reason we have Hanukkah. They had to cleanse the temple from an idol like this being placed in it to Antiochus IV and a pig being sacrificed on the altar. And we saw the pig, right? The swine. Yeah. on the invitation of Charles' coronation, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So, Charles has the imagery he ha of the first beast. He has the imagery of the little horn of the eyes of a man. He has the name calculation in Hebrew and English on the biblical numbering system. He has the idol that is to go on the Temple Mount. He has been crowned King of Israel, quote unquote, even though the public didn't get to see that behind that screen, where he might have been pledging allegiance to the devil for all we know, and he has been Satan's prince since July 1969, when he and his mother were both facing the red dragon when he was crowned Prince of Wales. And by the way, I'll mention one more thing, Tony, and then I'll let you come up for air because I'm talking a lot here, right? If you want to ask any questions. But the one other thing I'll mention is when he was crowned in July 1969, the entire world could see that his mother was the one putting the crown on his head. And they were both facing the red dragon at the time when he was crowned Prince of Wales, Prince of the Red Dragon, Prince of Satan. At that time, Charles subsequently related in biographies that it was his father who put the crown on his head, his father who handed him the vestments to be Prince of Wales, who gave him the letters patent and so forth. But the whole world could see it was his mother doing that. There's one motion picture camera that took multiple frames of something that happened while his mother was putting the crown on his head. None of the other cameras captured it, but there was an X-like streak of light, a pattern, two streaks in an X-like pattern 
that happened at the moment that his mother was putting the crown on his head, captured on video footage. And I show this in one presentation, uh, at one that I gave before church. It's on YouTube, and I'm showing it in the book too. That streak of light went from the backrest of the queen's throne through her and through Charles' head. The backrest had the dragon of Wales on it, on the queen's throne at the investor. And then the other beam, which made the ax like pattern, went through the queen and through Prince Philip's head, who is sitting on his throne still. At the moment, she put the crown on his head. And Charles later, later said it was his father who did these things, even though it was the queen. You know, in the video footage, who did it? Mm. I submit that he knows that it was Satan who, you know, animated all of that. Yeah. And he's referring to the devil as his father. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's, wow, there's a lot of information in that. It is extremely interesting. Um, just one more point. I, I was thinking back to um, the Commonwealth Games opening and the whole symbolism around that which Charles presided over as well. The whole beast symbolism, it was so, gosh, uh, so overt, you know. You couldn't really yep. miss it. Well, you shouldn't be able here, to miss it. Yeah, in fact, uh, here it is on the screen. Let me pull up um, an image. Charles basically oversaw that thing, and they led the whole world in worship of this Moloch idol bull right here. Yeah. And they did a lot of things around this. This is fully documented in the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. But there was a mock Tower of Babel, this mock bull ridden by a woman. There was a Luciferian all seeing eye mm. over the tower. And let me bring up an image. And there was a coiled serpent. Okay, so here's the all seeing eye of Lucifer yeah. over the mock Tower of Babel. The coiled serpent is right here. My mouse is moving across it. Yeah. And the thing is writhing all the way to the top of the tower. And this is supposed to be its head. Mm. Now, this mock head of the serpent, the all-seeing eye, if you will, yeah. moves from over the tower here to being over the bull yes. uh, yeah. a couple of times in the ceremony. And one of the most shocking things that they did uh, while it was over the bull is they put in this something that implied, um, let me find it here, that Lucifer is an alien, that the devil mm. is an alien. So right here is a screenshot of that. You can see the pattern they've made with the uh, searchlights. Yeah. And this thing here at the top, right above the bowl, that's one instance of them, and they, they darkened it over the towers. They're basically portraying that eye of Lucifer migrating to be right here over the bowl. And this thing was pulsating, you know, to the music at this point Jeez. in the concert. Well, uh, on my YouTube channel, and I'll post a link to this interview with you also uh, when it's available, but on my YouTube channel, there is one playlist having to do with counterfeit aliens and UFOs and so forth. And I give the real information, by the way. I don't know if you've seen this on my channel. I give proof of what's actually in our solar system on the moon, on Mars, and comets and asteroids that has been hidden by NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency from the world that they haven't talked about publicly. But UFOs are real. They're not actually aliens. They're, they're counterfeits. But if I go into this playlist here, there's one for the Battle of Los Angeles that I have a link to it. And right here. So people can look at the actual film footage. This is 1942, an actual event that transpired over Los Angeles when an anti-gravity craft, a UFO, came in off the coast of California, tracked on radar. And thousands of anti-aircraft rounds were fired at this thing when they had the spotlights uh, targeting it trying to down it. This is a real event. It was reported in, by multiple news sources in the United States in 1942, and there was film footage of it. So I'm going to play this for a moment. I'll mute it. So this is the battle, you know, the actual film footage. Mm -hmm. That photo was a real photo. It's the most prominent still photo that was taken right here. Yeah. February 26, 1942 is what they're saying. But at any rate, they were recreating that uh, my YouTube channel is author Tim Cohen, for those who want to go and see it. 
And there's a discussion of that bull idol and what happened in this presentation here, this interview. But uh, there's a, I don't know, a 19 minute segment on it. And you're free to share that too uh, with your audience. Everybody can come see that and share that. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, when we come back to the Birmingham event, you can see they kind of recreated it mm. over this bowl. Yeah, interesting. And by the way, there was a song from Duran Duran that introed this about aliens mm. coming down to the earth. So the music went with this too. Yeah. They were effectively trying to say, Lucifer is an angel, and not just an angel, excuse me, but an alien. And you'll notice the all seeing eyes not over the tower here because it's migrated to be over the bowl. Mm. And they put all the flags of the nations around this bowl to indicate that the world is worshiping the bowl. In this case, it's all the Commonwealth nations. Yeah. Okay, but the whole world was invited to participate and watch. And they did this new age ceremony where they bowed down to, worshiped um, this bowl. Oh, and by the way, they had the red dragon on the Tower of Babel too, just to point that out, when Wales mm. was entering the arena right there on the Tower of Babel. And they actually did explicitly call it the Tower of Babel. I'm not just saying that. They called it that explicitly during the event. The announcers and so forth did. And see that? Yes. Yeah. Ridden by a woman. Mm -hmm. They even had this thing crying mock tears as if it were like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm. They had tears streaming down from it right here. But anyway, they're all pointing their New Age Luciferian crystals. Now, these crystals are from a star that represented Lucifer that fell to earth. And these new age dreamers, quote unquote, picked them up and used them to represent the devil and to pray to them and then converged with them to this event in a false rapture type event when they entered the ceremony. You know, being raptured in their homes, literally floated to the stadium, dropped off in the stadium, and then doing all of this stuff around this bowl when it came onto the scene. And so you've got Stella here riding the bull and all these people submitting to it and worshiping it. And of course, the whole audience is being invited to participate. There's much, much more to this, but I, I go into that in other interviews and I know we don't have time for that today. But yeah, just I'll add one thing to this. So this is literal Molech bull idol worship that happened under Charles himself. Here he and uh, Camilla are getting out of their Charles vehicle you know, at the event. And here's Charles opening it. Yeah. After watching all of this, he's opening it, right? Yes. So after his coronation, the day after his coronation on May 6th, on May 7th, there was a coronation concert. And at that concert, they played up eco-fascism a lot. And they had actual Satanists performing. So Katy Perry, for example, mm -hmm. she's an overt Satanist, outright it, Satanist. Yeah. Who's also uh, ridden, Lionel, she also rode the beast in a, um, a, another ceremony several years ago too. So. Yeah, and Lionel Richie, in my opinion, is probably a Satanist, but he had non-Christians, you know, doing the singing and so forth, and they had light shows on and around them, including promotion of the satanic sexual agenda, this what I call sexual Satanism, mm -hmm. you know, with the with them. Uh, basically co-opting God's rainbow and turning it into an evil symbol. Yeah. But all that was happening at that coronation concert. And one of the things they had was a drone display of various creatures on earth at one point. And the final thing toward the very end of the ceremony was the drones making this colorful head of a giant owl over everybody. Mm. The owl, apart from the bull, is the other major symbol mm. of Molech yeah. you know, in paganism historically. So, so again, it was more Moloch bull idol worship, in this case, connected to eco-fascism at Charles' coronation concert the next day. Yeah. Wow. Yep, it's fascinating. There's certainly an awful lot in there, and I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, but yeah, I think we, we, the audience is going to get the gist of it. Um, that was a pretty amazing presentation. So thank you very much, Tim. That was yeah great to have you back after all this time, uh, you. you know, with more information now that you didn't have back the last time I interviewed you.
Yes, that's true. And of course, there's a whole lot more in the book than what we can cover in this interview. So let me just, if you don't mind, I'll tell people one more time where they can get things and exactly. see things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my site, my publisher site is prophecyhouse.com. And I'll have somewhere in the order of thir- uh, 40 books out, somewhere around 40 books in two to three years, most of which have been worked on for more than a decade each. Right now, people can get North Korea ran in the coming world war, Behold a Red Horse, and they can get the second edition of the Antichrist in a Cup of Tea, the new edition, which is massively expanded and updated from the first edition. There will be three multi-volume series, which is my Messiah History and the Tribulation Period series. Started that when I was still at the Air Force Academy at the same time that I began to write the Antichrist in a Cup of Tea in 1987. There'll be another series called Solar Apocalypse, which gives the real evidence, the hard evidence on uh, so-called aliens and what actually exists in our solar system, including dinosaurs off of Earth, actual photos of real dinosaurs off Earth, you know, and other creatures, giant insects and titans and kaiju, the whole thing, all the things that are in science fiction that you think can't be real, a lot of them are real. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing photos from space agencies and giving people the ability to to download those directly from the space agencies themselves in this series so people can see they're real. Uh, So there's that series. And then there'll be another one called Israel, quote unquote, Peace in the Coming World War, which takes a 90 page section of the original Antichrist and the Cup of Tea book uh, on the Mideast peace process, showing that whole thing is under Charles and always has been since 1987. But it takes that and it's now a multi-volume series of many hundreds of pages covering everything to do with the Mideast peace process, that false process and the modern nation state of Israel and what's happening around that and the war that's coming between Israel and Iran and her surrounding adversaries leading to the Great Tribulations. That series is preliminarily titled Israel, quote unquote, Peace and the Coming World War, the Great Tribulation is Near. That'll be retitled when it's out. Then there are a number of individual books, including a book on the Exodus from ancient Israel, uh, ancient Egypt, showing that the history is real, that it actually happened, and identifying who the pharaohs were in ancient Israel's history, including who Joseph and Moses were in ancient Egypt, who their pharaohs were, who Moses' adoptive mother was, and the actual date when the Exodus transpired. So all that is in that one book, which is more, Tony, than any uh, paleont, excuse me, archaeologist in the world has been able to put together to date. There's not an archaeologist on the planet who's put all that together in one book. So I've done it, and it's in that coming book. So all that being shared, uh, again, the site is prophecyhouse.com, my publisher, where they can get things. And there are CD and DVD sets there, too, that are available now on a lot of these things. And um, then just one more time, my YouTube channel, where people can see uh, other things, and if they go to the uh, to the notes beneath some of these uh, things that I've uploaded, they'll see my other social media links. And then the interview with you uh, will be posted here as well, or at least shared under my playlist under this topic of the Antichrist's playlist here. Uh, and I think I have my original one with you there too. Uh, my prior ones are in these in these uh, playlists. Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you, Tim. Yeah, well, that was fascinating. uh, And thank you so much for coming back after all this time and doing this um, interview. Uh, There's so much to think about and go through. So, yeah, that was was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for uh, letting me go so long. That's no problem. Cheers. Cheers. Shalom. Thank you. And folks, don't forget also to visit a minute to midnight.com, our website, and subscribe to us there, and also our YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, and Apple Podcasts channels. Minute to Midnight's run 100% by donations. If you're able to help us, it's always greatly appreciated. Um, many thanks to those that do donate. And you can do that at our website, a minute to midnight.com, if you want to help us out. And the music used, I've written, played, and recorded. Stay safe and God bless and uh, hopefully we'll be back with another video, God willing, in a few days' time.